Hey True Crime Besties, welcome back to an all new episode of Serialistly. Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of Serialistly with me, Annie Elise. I hope you all had a nice weekend and that you are gearing up for another week, whether you're listening to this on your drive into work or maybe you're at the house cleaning. I know everybody listens to it at different stages, but whatever you're doing, I hope that you're in a good place mentally because this case is going to definitely go off the rails a little bit. And It's honestly every single parent's worst nightmare. That's the best way to describe it. It's horrific, and I don't want to say that to be like triggering or anything, but it is every parent's worst nightmare. It's a case that has been going viral recently all over TikTok. We talked about it briefly about a year ago before we knew a ton of details, but ever since it's been going viral again, so many of you have been emailing me, DMing me, saying, can you dive into this? Can you cover it? What are all the details? Because so many people are now not only demanding answers, but justice for so many of the people involved in this case. And it's one that is really, really horrific. So, you know, I just kind of want to jump right in. Holly McFadden was a beautiful 35-year-old mother to three teenagers. She had two daughters, a 13-year-old named Tiffany Guess and a 17-year-old named Riley Allen. And she also had a son named Michael Mayo, who was 15 years old. So she definitely had her hands full with three teenagers. I mean, we're talking 13, 15, and 17, right in that peak age age of, you know, rebellion, growing up, coming of age, all of the things. Now, the three children had different biological fathers. However, they all three called Tiffany, the 13-year-old's biological father, Joe, their dad. He was a prominent male figure in all of their lives. He and Holly had been married for 13 years prior to their divorce, and he had been in the oldest, Riley's life, since she was just a year old. Although he and Holly had gotten divorced, he still cared for and loved all three children, as if they were his own. Joe had actually expressed major interest in adopting Michael and Riley, in fact. Holly eventually remarried after her divorce on May 26, 2022. She married a man named Jesse McFadden. Holly moved herself and her kids in with Jesse to Henrietta, a city of about 6,000, about 90 miles from Oklahoma City, from Westville, a town roughly 100 miles southwest of Henrietta. Although everything on the outside seemed as though they had a great marriage and were happy together, no one was prepared for what they would learn about Jesse just a year after he and Holly got married. In 2003, Jesse was charged and arrested for attacking a 15-year-old girl at knife point with very sexual motives. He was convicted of this crime, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. However, he was released in October 2020 after serving only 17 years of his 20-year sentence. Jesse met Holly after he was released, and although Jesse was supposed to be on the registry for his previous conviction, somehow Holly and her family had no idea about Jesse's sinister past. He attended all of the kids' sports activities, games, and was a seemingly supportive stepfather. Or so everybody thought. On Monday, May 1st, 2023, Jesse was supposed to appear in court for trial after being charged with having inappropriate photos of children and for communicating with a minor in a very graphic and sexual way. In 2016, Jesse was caught with a contraband cell phone in prison, and when officers confiscated it, they went through the cell phone and they found very graphic themed conversations, videos, photos, all with a 16-year-old girl named Caitlin. Caitlin's grandfather had reported their communications to prison officials, according to an affidavit from a Department of Corrections investigator. He was accused of sending these graphic and explicit photos to this 16-year-old girl and acting in a way that prosecutors described in court documents as manipulative and controlling of the victim. Jesse faced new charges, one count of soliciting graphic conduct with a minor and another of possession of child content. 
the state law requires inmates to serve 85% of their sentences. Throughout most of his time behind bars, Jesse had an inmate classification level in line with outstanding evaluations for work, education, and other criteria, which meant that he was eligible for release upon completing that 85% of his sentence. When he was caught with the cell phone, he lost that privilege for several months before regaining it back and ultimately getting out in October of 2020. The big question is how can someone like that regain the ability to leave prison early when they're still doing very similar things as to what landed them in prison in the first place? I will never understand that. Why was he not just held in jail until his trial? Getting caught with that cell phone should have been immediate grounds for no early release. So upon his release, Jesse apparently followed the registry rule of checking in with the sheriff's office every 90 days. However, he didn't follow the other rules because to my knowledge, offenders are not allowed to be hanging out in areas where random children are, like schools and sporting events. But somehow Holly must have never noticed those check-in days or maybe she straight up ignored what was really going on. Who knows what the truth is there? Previously, Joe and her had made an agreement that if anyone was going to be around the kids, they had to be background checked. Holly told Joe that the background check on Jesse was clear. Ahead of the jury trial that was set to begin on May 1st for those two new charges, Court documents showed that Jesse planned to argue that he was talking to a friend of the 16-year-old, who was actually 21 and not a minor. The reason the trial had been set for 2023 was due to his trial initially being put on hold after a prosecutor broke their foot and could no longer try the case. At another point, a defense attorney for Jesse had died. Then came a slew of delays associated with the pandemic that drug the trial out, unbeknownst to everybody. Nearby, two families were stressing about where their two daughters were, but had no clue about the issue going on with Jesse. Ivy Webster and Brittany Brewer were best friends with Tiffany. They both had been spending time that weekend with their best friend Tiffany. This was a very normal occurrence for the girls, to be over at Tiffany's house and to spend the night and to go swimming at a nearby ranch with their friends, just as most teenagers do. The girls were due to come back home by 5 p.m. on Sunday night. They were supposed to be in McAllister that day to go swimming, which was about 35 minutes from Henrietta. But when they didn't come back home and had also quit answering their parents' calls and texts, and with Ivy's Life360 app also being turned off, the parents got worried and reported them both as missing and in danger on Monday morning. Law enforcement put out a missing and endangered poster with the girls and Jesse on it. Jesse also never showed up to court for his trial that morning. Officers waited outside the property for a warrant, but when they got it, nothing could have prepared them for what they would discover. And Ivy and Brittany's parents could have never been prepared for what they were about to find out. When officers arrived on Jesse's property, they were met with a horrific scene. They found seven deceased bodies scattered throughout the property. One of the bodies was the body of Jesse. When reports first came out about this horrific discovery, the identities of the others were unclear. But we now know that the other six victims included Jesse's wife, Holly, and her three children, Tiffany, Michael, and Riley. The other two victims were Tiffany's best friends, Ivy Webster and Brittany Brewer. Ivy was 14 years old and Brittany was 15 years old. All seven people had suffered from gunshot wounds to the head from a 9mm pistol. Their bodies were found in two different groups on the large property where Jesse and Holly rented their home in this town. One group, which included Ivy, Brittany, and Riley, was found about a quarter mile from the home. The bodies were roughly 100 to 150 yards apart in a scene that has been described as staged. The four others were found in a heavily wooded part of the land. It has been said that it looked as though they were killed somewhere else and then moved to those locations, or that they were running from their killer. Upon investigating, investigators from the Okmagee Sheriff's Office determined that Jesse had killed his wife, her children, and the friends before he finally turned the gun on himself. A possible motive as to why these killings took place still remains unclear. However, Jesse was supposed to start his jury trial that same morning that the bodies were found. And in my opinion, I wonder if that is the possible motive here. 
Maybe he did that so that he could keep his secret and his family and wife wouldn't have to see all the evidence and details of his sick relationship that he was having with a child while he was in prison. Text messages from Sunday night, April 30th, have shed some light onto what may have been going through Jesse's mind just before his killing spree. The woman who reportedly accused Jesse of sexting with her from his prison cell when she was 16 received messages from Jesse the night before the trial was set to start. In the messages, he appeared to blame her for not dropping the charges against him. Jesse texted her, saying, I did exactly what I promised I would do when I got out. I got a marketing job making great money and was being advanced. Then said, been there two years now and made a great life like I promised I would do with you. This is all on you for continuing this. In a separate message, he said, now it's all gone. I told you I wouldn't go back. Those texts are very disturbing to me and makes me believe more that this was his motive to not go back to jail and his family not seeing the evidence against him in this case. In my opinion, he was mad that he couldn't control this woman into dropping the charges against him and all of his lies were about to be exposed. The victim he was initially in prison for, named Crystal Smith, spoke out about her experience as well as Caitlin's. And here's Crystal's interview. Crystal, I can't imagine what, what you're thinking at this time, given what you've been through and then just hearing from Milena about what she's coping with. I mean, I'm okay. My trauma's been dealt with. I just, my heart goes out for the families. Um, I begged the DA a long time ago not to um, ever let him out of prison because I knew that he would he would do this to someone else. Um, I've never been contacted um, about when he was getting out. The last time I heard um, from anybody was when I was 17 and the DA or whoever it was told me that Jesse was really high on meth, that he's sorry, um, things happen and I need to learn how to forgive. And I hung up on her and I tried to suppress the memories and move on with my life. I don't have any contact with Canadian Shores or any of that area. Um, and the minute I heard about this this morning, um, I had a gut-wrenching feeling that those babies weren't going to come out of there. Crystal, this this happened to you at, at the same age. I mean, Brittany's mom just told us she had only just turned 15. You were 16 when he attacked you. What was the, what was the circumstance? He was actually, um, so I grew up, uh, my dad lived around there, um, around Canadian Shores, and um, I was, I grew up with um, his girlfriend and her sister. Um, and he had showed up, I had been at a party that night um, in McAllister, and I had left my truck in McAllister and got, um, drove home by someone else, some friends. Um, and three friends, actually, and my stepmom had drove by that night in the middle of my, but they kept going because my truck wasn't there. But Jesse had showed up. Um, and kept telling me that Holly kicked him out, he needed somewhere to go, um, things like that. And I was like, look, you really just need to call Holly, like, you don't need to be here. And then I remember just being shoved through my door, um, a sock in my mouth, and being tied up to my own bed, um, and just horrible things happening. I remember the DA telling me that I would never have children. Um, I just suppressed a lot of those memories, and then today brought it all back. And I just, all, all I wanted was those babies to be brought home. And that's what we were all hoping for when that alert went out, um, that they would find those, those girls. Um, I've, I've been talking to uh, Caitlin Babb. Um, they've been putting her case on the back burner um, for a lot of years. Um, the girl with the, with the charges that he was supposed to go to court for, he basically told her this morning, um, and I have screenshots of him telling her that when this all goes down, this is going to be your fault. And supposedly she gave that to the cops, I guess, and nothing was done. And I want to be really clear, Crystal, you're, you're talking about uh, Caitlin. She was the subject of those yes. lewd photographs that Jesse yes. McFadden had in prison on a contraband phone. Um, and she has spoken with you and, and given permission for you to tell her story. Yes. yes. She said and, that everybody she... could be off. Sorry, repeat that. She said everyone keeps blowing her off and not doing anything. She's been just shoved off to the back burner. And then last night, Jesse had messaged her, I guess, from a fake account called Holly Days. I have that screenshotted, too, um, telling her um, I've done everything I was supposed to do um, and you just won't let well enough alone, basically. Um, and now this is going to be on you. 
basically I felt like he's telling her he's gonna do something and she took it to the I said you need to take that to the cops and she said I did and nothing's being done and and she was prepared to to go through with this court hearing today because this court hearing today for him was about that she's been trying to do this um this all happened I guess when she was 15 years old he even told her about me um back when all this happened, tried telling her that um, it all started like I was trying to do it with him and then all of a sudden I didn't want it anymore. He had that girl so brainwashed. Both Ivy and Brittany's parents stated that they didn't know about Jesse's criminal history or that he was on the registry. In interviews, they described the sleepover that weekend as routine and said that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Nathan Brewer, Brittany's father, said that Jesse seemed like a nice and normal person. Ivy's mother, Ashley Webster, said that they lived on the same block as Holly and Jesse, and that their families had been friends since around December of 2020. She said she didn't know about Jesse's criminal history either. She said all of the kids spent time together. We never had any issues with the family. His wife seemed nice and would even drop off anything that she baked. She also added that Tiffany and Ivy were best friends, saying that Tiffany was over all the time and was like another kid to them. Holly's mother, Jeanette Mayo, has also said that her daughter didn't know the full truth about Jesse and that he had fooled her with his charm. Jeanette said that she noticed that Jesse was controlling of her daughter and controlled where and when she could go places and who she could talk to. He even took it a step further, apparently, and tracked the kids' cell phones when they went out with Jeanette. But whenever around Jeanette and her husband, he was very standoffish and quiet. Now, Jeanette and her husband had no clue how Holly and Jesse even met in the first place. They also didn't know anything about his criminal history until her husband had been just coincidentally searching the criminal history of a co-worker when he discovered Jesse's criminal history, and they were completely shocked when they discovered that. So apparently, they confronted Holly about the charges that they saw. And allegedly, when Holly then confronted Jesse about his past and why he was in jail, Jesse reportedly hired a woman to tell Holly that the whole thing was just a misunderstanding and that he actually didn't hurt that girl back in 2003 either. But that still doesn't answer the question of why Holly told Joe that Jesse had cleared a background check. My red flags would still be massively raised if my husband told me that there was just a misunderstanding that had put him behind bars for years and years and years. Just a couple of days after the murders, the victim's families and a sheriff's investigator were allowed to go to the house where their daughter spent her last days alive. In the house, they found multiple beds with restraints and the chains still attached with locks on them. In what appears to be the kitchen, the island had a chain and lock bolted to the center of it. There were graphic toys. There were devices for restraining people in bondage. There was lubrication bottles and different things scattered in various rooms. And there was a shelf lined with witchcraft-related books as well. There was also drug paraphernalia throughout the house, including what appeared to be drugged candy. There was also a ton of evidence, including computers, cell phones, dirty bed sheets, disgusting, all things that were collected by law enforcement as evidence. One of the families found their daughter's cell phone, along with other cell phones as well. Multiple computers and two laptops were also found. The worst part of that is that just a day prior, law enforcement said they could only find two phones in the home search. Justin, Ivy's dad, was clearly enraged by this and told the investigator, my daughter was locked up here, right here. That's what I just don't get. I know you guys are hurting too and I know you have a heck of a job to do too. You saw, you saw my daughter's dead shot in the head and I know what you're seeing and I know what you went through, but a lot of this stuff needs to be taken. You guys have to come back out here and do a whole other sweep because you missed so much. There's medicine, there's drugs, brand new locks that he put, and a brand new effing key and lock on the counter. Why are we not getting receipts and video of him purchasing this crap? The investigator then continued to collect more evidence. However, Justin and other family members returned to the property later and said he found even more evidence that again was not collected. Justin said he found a receipt for the padlocks attached to the restraints that showed that Jesse purchased them a couple of days before the murders. He also found a bloody wet wipe, five more phones, and more paraphernalia in the closet. 
When he called the police, they told him to leave the property. It also came to light that a notebook was found and that it was full of names. And the last names in the notebook were the six people that Jesse killed. The notebook thing makes me think that he's possibly done this before and that this was possibly premeditated. Just sick. In an emotional interview, Ivy's parents suggested that Jesse had impersonated their daughter over text message after killing her. Ivy's mom, Ashley, explained that she had been speaking to her daughter late night on Saturday night, but when she received a message from her the next morning, something didn't feel right. She said that she got a message from Ivy's phone that they were going to McAllister and that she would be home later. They now think that Jesse wrote that and that Ivy was probably no longer alive when that message was sent. According to Ashley, Ivy was a great kid who loved animals, people, and softball. Ivy was known for her kind heart and the love she showed to those around her. But more than that, Ivy was her best friend and was very detailed when she would text. She would text her before and after most things, always saying that she loved her, and the text about going swimming in McAllister was apparently out of her usual method of speaking, but she chalked it up to them just being in a rush. Ivy's parents also said that the read they got on Jesse was that he was a little weird, but since many of Ivy's friends would go to that house all of the time and hang out, they felt comfortable sending her there. There was also the added layer of Tiffany going to their house all the time, even staying the night on weekends, and they didn't notice anything off during any of those visits. Clearly, this man had everyone fooled into believing that he was some great guy, great husband, and father figure. Brittany's father, Nathan, fought back his tears as he spoke in an interview about his daughter, her outgoing personality, and her dreams of becoming a teacher or a vet. Jeanette, who lost not only one family member, but four family members, has since spoken out about her grandchildren and her daughter. Jeanette described Holly as a fantastic mother who was overprotective and loved her children more than anything. She explained that Holly was all about helping her children accomplish their dreams. Riley will forever be known for her artistic abilities with painting. She had hopes and dreams of being both an artist and a doctor. Michael will be remembered for his athletic abilities with track, cross country, and football. And Tiffany will be remembered for her sweet and loving spirit and her love of cross country and choir. Jeanette said that they all called her Tiffasaurus as a joke because she'd growl when she got mad. Tiffany's father also spoke out in an interview about his daughter, and it is extremely heartbreaking to listen to. Joe, I am just so sorry for you and what your family is, is dealing with and going through. Have you heard any more information or details from authorities about this crime? No, I've got one phone call, and that phone call was yesterday saying they found seven bodies, and that's the only thing I've heard. Who was it that made that phone call? It was uh, some investigator down there doing the, at the property, but that's all I know. And an investigator was able to inform you of the fate of your daughter? They said just seven victims. They didn't tell me who it was. How did you find out? Facebook. The news on the online. And uh, Holly's <laughs> mother uh, finally said or posted that uh, it was uh, the kids when they, they said on there, confirmed. So you've had no outreach, no contact from authorities in any way, um, even just for emotional support in, in this terrible crime? No, not at all. I am so sorry to hear that, Joe. Did you know anything about this perpetrator, this stepfather of Tiffany's, Jesse McFadden? Did you know anything about his history as a registered? No, because my daughter would not have spent a second in the house. I would have brought the whole damn police force with me or I would have drug him out by the nap of his head. Holly never mentioned anything at all to you about this. No, the only thing we ever talked about was at the beginning of their relationship, we had an understanding that no one would be around the kids unless we both agreed upon it and we did a background check and we were okay with it. I asked if there was a background check. She said, yes, nothing was there. So you were, you were lied to about the background because as we're learning now from the children's grandmother, Jan Mayo, uh, Holly did find out about the 
criminal background, but unfortunately, this she was my beast, too, so. Jesse Mc, yeah, J Jesse McFadden hired an actress to lie to her to say that she was the victim and that it was all a misunderstanding. Do you think that's why Holly didn't tell you? I don't know. I know that in the from the bottom of my heart, I know that if any one of them would have told me anything, I would have been there. Period. I'd have been there. I don't care, ex-wife not, I'd have been there. What was your last communication with your daughter, Tiffany? It was uh, last Thursday. I talked with her a little bit as I was talking with Holly. The kids were talking and talking to me in the background. All the kids, I don't, I don't care. The older two aren't biologically mine, but I was there since Riley was one. And t Michael James wasn't even born. And we were married 13 years. Those, Those are, are all kids. his kids. They all look to him as daddy. So this is this is an additional blow. I didn't know that. I didn't know you had a close relationship with the um, with the other kids, Riley and Michael. And you had a chance to, to speak on the phone? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even a few months ago, me and Holly were still talking about possibilities of me going through the legal system and still adopting the older two. Even though she had married Jesse McFadden? Yes. Do you have any Those thoughts as to why she might have been thinking that, there, that you could adopt the children when she was married to someone else? Because we've been working on it for over 10 years. They loved him. They, they didn't look at nobody else as their daddy. They this came, is their daddy right here. They came to me the last season of Darren Track and was like, uh, Dad, we know you're not our biological dad, but we don't care. You're our dad. So Riley and Michael called you dad as well? Yes. I am just so sorry for, for what you're going through. This is just, it's such a tremendous, I mean, it's, it's an unimaginable loss that what's happened. Um, at this point, do you hold anyone responsible for having let Jesse McFadden out of prison? It looks like three years early, while a crime had been committed in prison, a crime that was similar to the crime he committed that got him into prison. Yeah, he never should have been let out. The legal system completely failed. And not to mention, where's the sign? Where's the pink light? Where's all the indicators of somebody that's supposed to be your Somebody dropped the ball. Joe was kept in the dark. He didn't know anything about this guy's past. We didn't know anything about this guy's past until yesterday when it started popping up. And we're learning more and more about it in real time right now on the interviews you're doing that people that knew about it but yet for months and kept it privileged to their little circle and didn't tell joe anything about it i i imagine it, it might have been new information tonight that that this hired an actress to tell your ex-wife um and the mother of your kids that there was no all, that she was the pretend victim and that it was all a misunderstanding. I never knew Holly found out anything, and I never knew about a lie. I never knew about portraying nothing. I never knew about any of it. When they found out what Is the public anything? record was, and they knew Go ahead. that he was a knew that he had been in jail for all those years, somebody should have told this man so he could protect his daughter. And his, and his kids, his, all three is his kids. What would you like, Joe, what would you like us to all know about all three of those kids, Riley, Michael, and your daughter, Tiffany? Well, they were taken from me too soon, but the best moments of my life, my, uh, my oldest Riley was amazing. Great artist, all the time asking if she could just draw me something. My son, always excited about showing me a new video game and talking for hours about video games and engineering and building this and building that. My youngest, straight A student, 
most amazing, sweet, kind person. Doesn't matter where I'm at, what I'm doing, she'll come running and jump in my arms. Daddy. Track and star. I'll never get it again. Daddy's girl. Track star. Fun-loving kids, man. Fun-loving good kids. The fact that law enforcement did not at minimum tell him that his biological daughter was a victim is absolutely horrifying. It's hard enough when people find out that a friend dies via social media, but I cannot imagine finding out that my child died via a Facebook post. Truly horrifying in every way. So I think we all can agree that this guy Jesse is just a complete total monster, right? But it's not like this was just an isolated, crazy evil person. As it turned out, the apple didn't really fall that far from the tree because we learned more about Jesse's brother's background and it is equally disturbing. I'm going to get into all of that in just a moment, but really quickly, we are going to take a quick break here from today's sponsors. Thank you guys for understanding. Sponsors are what helps keep this podcast free. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. I feel like we can all probably agree that when we were younger, our sense of curiosity and imagination was probably way more than it is today. You grow up, you start getting more serious, you start getting more practical, and you kind of just lose that sense of curiosity, right? I mean, what's something that you would love to learn as an adult, and are you making time to learn that? Or was that, you know, curiosity and excitement lost in childhood? The good news is therapy can help you reconnect with your sense of wonder because your back-to-school era can really come at any age. You can get curious again. You can find that part of yourself again. What I love about therapy is I'm allowed to leave all of the serious day-to-day -day things at the door and just talk through what is bugging me, what is on my mind, where I want to get to, what my goals are. And what I love is that it is so convenient because I can do it just from the comfort of my own home. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So rediscover your curiosity with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash AE today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash A-E. It's officially back to school season, am I right? And shifting my wardrobe from summer to fall is always a challenge for me. I never can quite do it, especially living in California, because I feel like we don't have like the seasonal shift that other places have, and it just makes it way, way, way more difficult. But luckily, Quince offers timeless and high quality items that I just absolutely love, which helps ensure that my wardrobe stays fresh, but I don't blow my budget. They have premium fabrics and finishes. They have blouses and shorts from $30. They've got washable silk tops. They have like the best best sheets in the world. And the best part of all of it is that all of Quince's items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, they cut out the cost of the middleman and then they pass those savings on to us. Plus, they only work with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices. Plus, they use premium fabrics and finishes, which I just love. I recently did a full haul of new bedding. I've talked to you about their bedding before. I'm obsessed. But this time I got like the duvet covers. I got every like the big shams everything to match my sheets they're so soft you guys have to look at it. it's the bamboo sheet set they're always sold out I feel like but they are so so good so stock your wardrobe and your house and anything else with high quality essentials from quince go to quince.com slash ae for free shipping on your order and for 365 day returns that's q u i n c e dot com slash ae to get free shipping and 365 day returns quince.com slash ae Now, Jesse's brother was also arrested at one point, and get this, it was for kidnapping a woman, locking her in a dog cage, and repeatedly torturing her with an electric wire. I mean, can you even imagine? And it turns out Jesse had a younger brother, still does, in prison, a guy named Cody McFadden. And Apple didn't fall far from Jesse's tree there. Cody McFadden has quite a rap sheet of his own, sadistic and violent crimes. Let's just run through them since 2010, shall we? Making meth, assault with a deadly weapon, battery, aggravated assault, arson, assaulting a doctor, assaulting a police officer, cruelty to animals. And just most recently, last summer, that's July of 2022, he locked his ex-girlfriend in a dog cage for an entire day. He, 
He beat her bloody with a stick to the point where there was blood on every part of her body. He reportedly used jumper cables to electrocute her. She escaped and he set his house on fire in a standoff with the police. First of all, let's just talk about Cody for a minute. How was yeah. a guy walking the streets uh, as early as July of last year and able to commit that hideous and sadistic series of crimes against that girlfriend, that ex-girlfriend, with 15 years of violent criminal felony behavior? How was he walking the street last summer? How's any of this happen, Ashley? This whole system down there right now is a broken. I, as your last guest is saying, the former ADIC, he he articulated perfectly. Everything down there needs to be redone and revamped, and you need to bring in outside people right now. The leadership needs to be shaken up massively. I can't explain any of this. It's just tragic, all of it, internally, externally, everything. This case is clear proof of what happens when the system allows dangerous people back on the streets and just trust them to do the right thing. Jesse showed clear proof that he was unable to do the right thing when he was found with that cell phone. His cellmate tried to do everything that he could. His cellmate was not in there for any violent or neat charge of the sexual nature like Jesse, but he knew that things were off. I'm sure all of this comes as an absolute shock. Can you give me some insight as to the person who Jesse McFadden was, the person you knew? Um, so when I first met Jesse, he just seemed like a normal, clean cut, you know, another inmate, another convict. But, uh, you know, as we moved in together and we shared a cell, you know, it's about, uh, I would say about six months into it, I just realized how weird he was. Um, his conversations would always turn into sexual conversations. Uh, he was, he, he was just a, a very awkward guy. Um, I caught him, you know, stalking nurses down at the medical facilities. Uh, you know, he, he was just your very, very awkward, weird person. There was some report that he had actually assaulted someone in the prison as well. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure about him assaulting anybody in the prison. I'm not, it might have been me. before I knew him. Okay. Um, while you had, uh, you, you say that you never were at ease, that you slept with one eye open. Tell me about that. Oh, definitely. So about six months into our, you know, living arrangement, uh, he came out and told me that he was in prison. For, you know, of course, he justified it. He gave me his side of the story, which I found out later was not true. But, you know, at the same time, he's telling me that, you know, his first offense was like uh, statutory, I guess you would call it, like a, a 18 year old and a 17 year old girl and her parents found out or whatever. But, you know, I'm sitting there thinking about it while he's telling me and I'm just like, man, you don't get 20 years for that, you know, a statutory. You get 20 years for something very serious and very violent. So he knew that I knew that he was full of crap, you know. And so after that day, just the demeanor in our cell changed. And unfortunately, in Oklahoma, you can't move out of a cell. Once you're in there with somebody, you're stuck. Unless you fight them or you get in trouble, you're stuck with them. So I was stuck. And uh, I definitely was very uneasy. Um, you know, when you're locked in there with somebody at night, you can't get out. Nobody can hear you if you guys are fighting or, or you know, anything. And so... I always had to look over my back. I always had to sleep with one eye open, definitely. Were you angry that he was let out of his sentence three years early, ultimately uh, still facing similar kinds of charges? Well, yeah, of course. I, you know, we we stopped being cellmates in 2015. And even throughout the rest of my incarceration and then whenever I got out of prison, I uh, kept up with him. I was looking on the Oklahoma State Court Network to see when he was going to have to face, you know, the charges that he got while he was at that other prison. Um, I was, you know, looking up to see where he lived. 
Um, that's how I found out him and Holly got married. I was looking up to see, you know, if he had faced these charges that he was accused of, that he was guilty of. And, uh, and I saw their marriage certificate and it just blew my mind. I, I don't, I don't know why they would let him out of prison, why they didn't just take him st straight to county jail and await those charges. And I know you're upset because you reached out to police to, you know, let them know that this is a it was nerve wracking that you couldn't even see where he was uh, registered. And then ultimately after the killings, you let them know how upset you were. The one thing that I just want to let our viewers know about is that you actually had quite a deep connection to Holly, his wife, who he just murdered, along with her three kids and their two friends. That You used to be a pen pal of hers when you were incarcerated. Um, she told you that um, that she loved him and or she yeah. told you that she loved you and then on February 20th and February 21st you had this text exchange with her still as a friend saying hey and she texted back hi how are you and you said doing great finally enjoying my life you know I see you have a different last name and then she says yeah me and Jesse got married um, and you say how are the kids and she says they're great and huge lol so clearly you had a good relationship with her this must be devastating this news that not only holly but her three children are dead yeah i just feel like this definitely should not have happened it definitely should have been avoided uh, after i had that text exchange with her i contacted uh the police department where their marriage the, out of the the city where their marriage certificate was was listed as and uh of course he wasn't on the registry so i contacted them i say hey there's an offender in your area he's not on the registry they say well the state has a public list and i went and checked that list couldn't find him got back to him said hey you know this guy's a predator he has multiple offenses you know just trying to warn him just wanted to say something you know i couldn't say much to her because I didn't know if he read her text messages. I didn't want him to see him and hurt her, you know, the exchanges between us. I just wanted to keep it, you know, straight, you know, friendly. But, you know, when I reached out to the law enforcement and they didn't get back with me, I was just like, you know, what the heck, man? This I find it odd that he was supposedly in compliance with his 90 day check-ins, but somehow wasn't on the list. But it just proves that because of the system's neglect, lives were lost in a brutal, horrific tragedy. Not only did the system fail in that way, but I truly believe that the Olkmegee County Sheriff's Office and the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation failed in their investigation. While yes, this was a massive case, I don't even think that they did a bare minimum based on what we saw in regards to the state of that house. Just because the suspect is dead does not mean that there's not a story to be told. It does not mean that those innocent families don't deserve answers. The fact that they left all of those electronics, the paraphernalia, and items used for sexual purposes is absolutely unacceptable. In my opinion, I think that an investigation needs to be done on the Oklahoma law enforcement system as a whole, and that there should be many people losing their jobs for the disrespectful way in which the evidence in this case was handled. But that is just my personal opinion as a parent, as a mom, as a human being witnessing this from the outside. So as I said at the beginning of this episode, the last time that we talked about this case back in May of 2023, things were still insanely fresh. It definitely was still ongoing, and we didn't really know much else other than the broader scale of things of what happened. We also knew about Jesse's insanely disgusting past, but that was really it. Now, obviously, it's now been over a year since all of the news in this case broke. And like in most cases, time has revealed plenty more for us to go over. So I want to go into these updates, and these are absolutely crucial and key to understanding this case. Now, in my last episode, we knew for sure that each of the victims had gunshot wounds to the head. However, we hadn't heard anything specific from any of the autopsy reports at that point. Now, the reports have come back, and they showed that on top of them all being shot in the head, Holly, Michael, and Tiffany didn't just have one gunshot wound, 
but multiple gunshot wounds. Holly and all three of her kids also had what was described in these reports as leg and arm abrasions. Holly's tox report also came back, and it was the only one that did not come back as negative. It showed two things in her system. One was phetamine, which is commonly used for weight loss, and the other was citralopam, which is used to treat depression. And another detail that came back in these autopsy reports showed that unfortunately two of the victims had injuries that were consistent with sexual now, I think that this is something that everyone pretty much knew to be true even before the autopsy results came back. It's something that everybody expected to see in there. However, now seeing it in black and white in these autopsy results, it didn't make it any easier to digest how horrific this truly was. The two girls, Ivy and Brittany, who were the friends sleeping over, had blunt force injuries to their genital areas, which that seriously just makes me sick to my stomach and I cannot even begin to imagine the pain that their families felt when learning that news. It is so horrific. And like I said, it is every parent's worst, worst nightmare. Now, on top of the autopsy results coming to light, we also have learned a lot more about Jesse's background. And let me just say this. It doesn't at all shock me. I'm just going to be 100 with you guys. It does not surprise me in the least. It turns out that Jesse has a pretty extensive background when it comes to run-ins with the law. I mean, you have it beginning pretty much right after he dropped out of high school in the ninth grade. The first time he got in trouble was for drinking underage, which, okay, yes, that is pretty minor. But as we see, unfortunately, in so many of these cases, oftentimes, even when there is something minor in their past, even when they're young or a young adult, we often see it escalate. So things took a big jump for Jesse. And in 2002, Jesse ended up pleading guilty to grand larceny. This was for stealing over $80,000 from his grandfather. So, like I said, a pretty stark difference from some underage drinking to then stealing almost six figures from your own family. Then, a year later, in 2003, he was caught twice for driving with a suspended license. That was the same year that he assaulted his first known young victim, and that was also when he was sentenced to 20 years. We talked a bit earlier about some of those insane things that were inside of the home, right? And I think it's fair to say that there were a lot of questions surrounding the topic of his 90-day check-ins. I mean, for one, how would Holly not have known about these check-ins? And on top of that, how would she not have known about everything else that was weird inside that house? I know we briefly skimmed over Holly and whether or not she knew anything about Jesse's past, but apparently, now that this is going so viral, a lot of the internet has really been dragging her name through the mud, some even blaming her for what happened. Now, I want to make it clear, I don't believe in any way, shape, or form it's okay to blame her and say that she is responsible. Is there opportunity to say perhaps she could have noticed something or stepped in? Sure, everybody's going to have their own opinions. But at the end of the day, the horrific acts that were inflicted and everything that went down, that rests on Jesse's shoulders, 100%. And this harassment has extended to just beyond Holly. Holly's mom, Jeanette, has also been harassed on Facebook. She's had to deal with so, so many awful comments about her, about her daughter, and at the end of the day, she still is a grieving mother and grandmother. So she has argued to this day that her daughter was manipulated. She was fooled, just like everybody else. And to be honest, we may never know the truth. We may never know what she did or didn't know. So to just harass her relentlessly and now harass her family by extension, it's just getting out of hand. Especially when you remember that at the end of the day, they are victims in this as well. Now, the other question was that if these check-ins were regularly happening, because wouldn't they have thrown up some kind of red flags about the items that were in the house? It wouldn't have taken an expert by any means to see that something weird was definitely going on and that something was, you know, not right in this house. But with that, more information came out. The Oklahoma Department of Corrections Chief of Communications, named Kay Thompson, attempted to explain away everybody's questions and concerns surrounding all of this. And trust me, you're probably going to get frustrated when you hear all of this, because according to Kay, because Jesse was considered a, quote, habitual and aggregate offender, his check-ins were to take place every 90 days, which, okay, great, we already knew, that's cool. However, she claimed that these check-ins were primarily just to verify his address. Nothing more. It wasn't to look into any other details. It wasn't to look into the conditions of the house, anything that he may have, any activities he might be participating in. It's just to do an address verification, which, who is that helping? Especially if he is a habitual and horrific offender, 
who is that helping to just verify that that's where he lives? So it wasn't actually a check-in at all. Now, as Kay was releasing this statement, which apparently she thought was going to, you know, go far and that people were going to accept and think that it was a good statement, she also released to the public the official days that these check-ins took place. Jesse's first check-in was on June 10th, 2022. The next check-in was September 9th, 2022. Then the third was December 9th, 2022. And then lastly, March 8th, 2023. So four check-ins in total. And apparently all four of these check-ins made sure or checked the box of their list, which the list was the following things. Jesse's correct address and home phone number, his Department of Corrections ID number, all occupants of the home besides himself, which we know was Holly and the kids, any and all vehicles that he may have been driving, and then lastly, his employment status. So to me, and I'm no expert, but based on all of that, it kind of seems like they just went, you know, knocked on the door, asked if all of the information was the same, verified it, and then left. Which, yes, okay, technically that does sound like a check-in of sorts, I get it. But it definitely wasn't what everybody expected it to be. Certainly not. And let me just say, and I'm not trying to shame anybody, if this is truly what the worker's job is and that's all they're supposed to check, it's not their fault, but... This is, in my opinion, how so many things get missed in the system, how we often don't find out about things until it's way too late because they're just doing these topical check-ins of information that, at the end of the day, really doesn't even matter. Who cares what kind of car he's driving? Who cares if he's driving two different vehicles? People care about what's going on inside that house. People care about what activities somebody like that is participating in. So, verifying an address, that's important because you want to know where they're located, but like verifying the vehicle that they're driving, verifying their Department of Corrections ID number, who cares, right? Like, how is that keeping the public safe? And I get it, it's an element to it, but still, it just infuriates me because I feel like this is how things begin to slip through the cracks and we don't realize it until it's too late and somebody or multiple people end up dead. And it's not just me that is outraged by this, because now a news channel that is local to this tragedy really looked into all of this. They were emailing back and forth with the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, and they started asking all of the big questions that everybody wanted to know. Through these emails, they were actually able to find out some pretty interesting information as well, to say the least. Starting with the fact that there are check-ins, but then there are home compliance checks. Well, interestingly enough, there was only one home compliance check that was ever performed on Jesse, and it was June 24th, 2022. So you might be wondering, okay, well, when they did this home compliance check, did they see anything weird? Is there any documentation of it? Well, the answer to those questions is no. A straight black and white no. And you might be going, why? Isn't that what a home compliance is all about? Shouldn't they be, I don't know, searching the home? Yes, you're right. But here's why the answer is no. Because they did not even search inside that home. I'm sorry, how are you doing a home compliance check and not looking at the home? It makes absolutely no sense. It feels lazy, it feels reckless, and it feels irresponsible. So when this local news channel started pushing back on why there weren't more home check-ins on Jesse and why they weren't even doing thorough check-ins inside of the home, the Department of Corrections answered them. However, this answer was not a very good one. They claimed that, number one, home compliance checks are only done on sex offenders when a complaint is filed against the person, which has me automatically thinking two things. The first is that, okay, now it makes sense why there was only ever one home compliance check, because if nobody knew about his past or the fact that he was an offender, it would be pretty difficult to file a complaint on something that was, you know, non-existent as far as everybody around him was concerned. But the second thing that I'm wondering is, who did know? Because there was a complaint filed. So who did know and filed a complaint against him? The Department of Corrections also claimed that they couldn't actually go through the home and do a thorough walkthrough. Because similar to just anybody who's off the street, if you don't give somebody permission to come into your home, they can't just barge in. They need a warrant. They need probable cause. So the sheriff continued by saying that even if Jesse had let them in, it's not like they were granted a search warrant and could go through every single drawer or every single cabinet, look in every nook and cranny. They would have been able to walk through rooms where the doors were open, but that's about it. So this information obviously enraged everyone, as, you know, honestly, it probably should. What's the point in somebody filing a complaint against a known child predator and assaulter if the Department of Corrections can only knock on the door and basically say like, hey, is everything good? You assaulting any minors? You doing anything bad? No? Okay, great. Well, see you later. 
I mean, it just sounds insane to even say that out loud. And while I understand everybody's frustration with how things were handled with this case, especially in the early days, I do kind of understand the sheriff and the Department of Corrections pretty much just saying that they were just following the rules. That it was, you know, out of their hands when it came to the check-ins and to the home compliance checks. It's not necessarily the people who are executing it who are at fault, sometimes, but not all the time, but it's more a system that seems to be built for failure and for loopholes and for things falling through. It seems like a much higher up issue that we all should be angry about, that we should all, quite frankly, be concerned about. And just because this specific case happened in Oklahoma, it doesn't mean that it's not happening right next door to where your kids sleep every night. And I'm not saying that to fearmonger. I'm just saying that to make everybody aware that we never know the dangers that are lurking right next door. You never know, which is so insane and scary, and it makes me sick to even think about it. Now, as if all of that isn't insane and frustrating enough, there's even more. All of these new updates are full of very important information, and information that is very, very disheartening. And each new detail just proves over and over that this should have never happened. Even though it's turning into fall, there are warmer, sunnier days that are calling, and you can fuel up for them with Factor's no prep, no mess meals. Meet your wellness goals this summer thanks to the menu of chef crafted meals with options like Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Factor's fresh and never frozen meals are dietitian approved, and they're ready to eat in just two minutes. So no matter how busy you are, you will always have time to enjoy nutritious, great tasting meals. With 35 different meals and more than 60 add ons to choose from every single week, you will always have a new flavor to explore. Make today the day that you kickstart a new healthy routine. I mean, honestly, what are you waiting for? For me, I love it because I can keep kitchen time to a minimum. Factor meals are ready in two minutes, so there's no shopping, no prepping, no cooking, no cleaning up. It's so, so easy. And your entire day can be delicious. From breakfast to dessert, you can stay fueled with these easy, nutritious options. You can also treat yourself to high-quality, restaurant-style meals that have premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, blackened salmon. I mean, so good. Head to factormeals.com AE50 and use code AE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. That's code AE50 at factormeals.com slash AE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month while your subscription is active. We talk about a lot of unsafe things on this podcast, right? And have you ever felt a sense of unease when you leave your home, maybe wondering if everything will be safe while you're away? I know that I have, but it wasn't until somebody actually broke in my home several years ago that I realized I needed to get a security system. And I knew that my family, my husband, my dog, everybody deserved the absolute best. And after some extensive research, I found Simply Safe, and I have loved having Simply Safe protect my home for over two years now. The security and the service have exceeded all of my expectations. And what I love most is I can literally sign on on my phone no matter where I am and I can look at my cameras, I can look at the security system, I can look at everything. With fast protect monitoring and live guard protection, Simply Safe agents can act within 5 seconds of receiving your alarm and they can even see and speak to intruders to stop them in their tracks. You'll never be locked into a long-term contract so you can cancel at any time. Plus pricing is transparent and affordable. It's less than $1 per day with no hidden fees. Simply Safe has been named best home security systems by U.S. News and World Report for five years running, and they offer the best customer service in home security, according to Newsweek. It's so easy to install and activate your Simply Safe system in less than an hour, or you can also even choose a professional installation and have a pro come do it for you. So protect your home with 50% off a new Simply Safe system plus a free indoor security camera when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com/seriallessly. That's simplysafe.com/seriallessly and sign up today. There's no safe like Simply Safe. For example, on January 29th, 2023, just months before the murders took place, a complaint actually came into the Oak McGee County Sheriff's Office specifically expressing concern about Jesse. The caller was anonymous, although it has been verified to have been a woman. And this caller told the Sheriff's Office that she was extremely concerned with Jesse living in a house with three minors. And this call, it was not brief. The woman on the line specifically told the authorities that she wanted this call documented. She wanted Jesse to be looked into. 
So this sounds pretty serious to me, like she possibly saw or heard something firsthand, something that alarmed her enough to not only make the call, but then reiterate how she wanted it documented, how she wanted Jesse looked into. I don't know if somebody would go that hard on just suspicion alone. Possibly, but we haven't seen that too often. So after the call, the dispatcher's notes showed that Jesse was looked up in the sex offender registry, and they basically just confirmed his marriage to Holly and the fact that he lived with three children. But after that, nothing else was done. And while the caller may not have specifically said, hey, I think Jesse is going to murder his entire family, plus some other innocent victims, it does seem like they were pretty clear about the fact that Jesse was nothing but trouble, and they thought that he was going to end up doing something bad. They thought that these minors were in danger being in that same house with him. And this wasn't even four months before everything happened, which is just so aggravating and heartbreaking because maybe this could have been preventable. Maybe if they had looked into things a little bit more, intervened, interviewed somebody, and I don't know. I don't know if we're even built for that in a, as a system and if that's even possible, but maybe it could have been prevented somehow. And we could all ask all the live long day until our faces literally turn blue, why was Jesse released early? Why did nobody stop this man? Well, here's what the county DA had to say as for why he was ever even released. Me being the DA of Muskogee County, honestly, I accept responsibility for that. Even though I was not here for most of that time period, ultimately, it's my responsibility. Do you think the credit system is a good system to be using? That's DOC policy, and I'm not going to get into DOC policy. One of the most disappointing factors in this case was we let this case to go on as long as it did. And that's unacceptable. It just is. In retrospect, do you feel like things should have been done differently with this case? Absolutely. There are a lot of things. I mean, as, as many people have said, the justice system broke on this case, and it did. But I have second-guessed myself all week long about what I could have done or should have done differently. Um, and it's been tough. It's been really tough. Now, as frustrated as we may all be, and everybody who is reposting these TikToks and everybody who is so outraged by this, we can't forget the real people who were affected in all of this. All of the friends and all of the family who are all now dealing with something that nobody should ever be going through in a million years. Now, through this tragedy and through this grief, Ivy Webster's parents have tried to harness it. They've tried to do something with it. And Justin and Ashley Webster, as well as other friends and family members of the victims, have taken this horrible and, in my opinion, preventable tragedy to advocate for possible future victims. Not of Jesse's, of course, but of other scumbags just like him. Ivy's parents, specifically, have been willing to do media interviews literally since day one all out of hope that their pain will be seen and heard and that something different will possibly be done. Justin, you just went back down to the scene to talk to us just why you wanted to go back there this morning. I wanted to see her. I wanted answers. I wanted to go on the land and get the answers myself, and I know I can't. But we need to be told answers of everything here soon. I'm tired of hearing we can't we, we we can't know right now and it's frustrating we need to know everybody needs to know i mean you you kind of seem like you're maybe a little bit upset with the law enforcement mm -hmm. you know kind of kind of talk to me about that i mean they, he should have been stuck in jail he should have rotted in there from the get-go especially if he was sneaking phones in and he snuck a phone in jail and solicited with a minor in okay. jail and was still released. And was still released. If that's not any proof that he can't be controlled, then I don't know what is. And Okmulgee County Jail and McAllister and Pittsburgh County, they need to be held accountable. They do. We need answers of why this monster was released. They're currently advocating for something called the Knight's Law. Knight with a K. They wanted to be passed and put into effect immediately, and the name came from the school that the kids went to, whose mascot is a knight. It's a law that actually passed the state house last session, but it was stalled in the Senate. Now, this law proposes a ton of changes, so I want to go over a couple of the main ones. The biggest thing that it proposes is that sex offenders not only receive harsher punishments, but that they have absolutely no possibility of an early release. Because remember, Jesse was sentenced to 20 years, and he only ended up serving 85% of his sentence. 
so he should have still been in prison when these crimes took place, but for whatever reason, he was let out early. The law also would push for mandatory notices to every single resident within five miles of a sex offender's home and work address. That would include not only landlords informing every resident, but also realtors, all as part of the closing process during the sale of a home. Now, this next part is specifically focused on the fact that Holly allegedly never knew about Jesse's background, because this portion of the law proposes that all marriage applications have background checks, and that the marriage application is automatically denied if the non offender has minor children. Which I feel like that is really important. Some people say that it's too harsh, that it's unfair, but as we've learned in some of these cases, it seems like sometimes parents don't even care about their child's safety. Sometimes they even use their children knowing they're going to be assaulted or abused by their partner because they just want to keep their partner happy. It's sick, it's deranged, it's disgusting, but it happens. So this is literally the perfect example of having something in place to protect the children whose parents won't protect them themselves. Next, the law proposes that a registered offender not be granted custody of their children and also not be allowed to reside with any children, which I think that one is pretty self-explanatory. It also proposes that after serving your full sentence and being released from prison, failure to register as a sex offender should be a felony. I think that is also pretty self-explanatory and is honestly kind of wild that it's not already a thing and put into place. It also talks about the parts of the law revolving around schools because they want all schools to use the Raptor system and to be fully fenced in. The Raptor system would basically scan people's IDs and if they have any crimes that are sexual or violent, it would immediately come up and the authorities would be called. So again, just more checks and balances in the systems and putting things in place so that we can protect children, especially when parents won't protect them themselves. The entire proposal for this law is on change.org, and right now it has over 30,000 signatures. It has a goal of about 35,000, but it's very close to meeting the goal. The laws that are in place right now uh, failed us, and you know Oklahoma has no urgency right now to strengthen the laws. They've had two session, sessions since our daughter's murder to strengthen those laws, and they have not yet. And it's scary to know, as other parents out there, that the same tragedy that happened to us can happen again today. So I'm going to put the link in the description of this episode so that you can check this out, and if you feel compelled to, you can sign this petition as well. Now, we also have to talk about Ivy's mom, Ashley. She has been consistently and just relentlessly posting on TikTok, just advocating for victims left and right, sharing her experience, sharing some of the darkest parts of what she has gone through. This includes a ring camera video of the moment that she found out that her little Ivy had passed away. Take a listen. Not only is she being so vulnerable and sharing some very emotional things, but she's doing it all with the effort of raising awareness, sharing her story on just how terribly this whole thing was handled. She's also answering questions, just trying to help, trying to make sure that this doesn't happen to another family. She is seriously working overtime for her baby and for so many other victims. And I can't imagine as a mother the resilience that you have to have to be able to move forward so quickly in such a way to just harness that grief and channel into strength and just advocacy, it's very admirable. Now, while I can't go through every single second of every single video that she has posted, I am going to go ahead and play some clips from her TikTok account that I think do need to be heard, viewed, and shared. So this is gonna be part one about what happened to my daughter. So this is a Snapchat that was taken the night that she was murdered. Uh, Me and her were Snapchatting the night that she died. And isn't she beautiful? Um, Me and her were Snapchatting back and forth when she was at Tiffany's house. And... Sorry. Um, She, earlier that day, Jesse had picked her up. I did not know Holly wasn't there at the time. Usually they kind of did everything as a family, but Jesse had picked Brittany up first and then they picked up Ivy. 
they went to the mall and then they were going to go to some like sky zone place like a trampoline park but it was too busy so they ended up leaving there and going to like main event we have seen video of them going in everybody looks like happy like it's a good day so throughout the day they end up going to like Brahms Walmart um, and this is spread out so I mean some at some point this is at like nighttime as well so this video or this picture of her was sent to me is about 11 o'clock at night um, I ended up sending her a video a snapchat of her dog um, this is important because this is around the last time I'm hearing from her. This is about 11 p.m. And she had responded with, Mom, it's past your bedtime, you know, go to bed. Because I'm someone that usually goes to bed pretty early because at that time I had to get up, you know, Monday through Friday for my job in the morning early. So on the weekends I stayed up later, but, you know, like she would joke with me because, you know, I go to bed early. But with Ivy, it was always, Mom, love you. You know, me and her had, like, a best friend relationship. We were very close. Um, she was a very sweet girl. And that's important because it will come up later. So, uh, sorry. Anyways, that was around 11 p.m. at night. In my next video, it's going to be talking about what ended up happen happening that night. Remember, this is just coming from, like, OSBI. We don't know exactly for sure, for sure, because no one, everyone that was there is deceased, unalived. But this is what they gather from receipts. Jesse bought the chains and locks Wednesday, and all of this stuff happened late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. So sometime after 11 p.m., because that's when I was Snapchatting with my daughter, Jesse started putting together his plan, or uh, putting it in action, is when he started rigging up the house. Why, were there no, why was there no blood, and why were they found outside? There was no blood inside, because Jesse unalived them outside. Um... Uh, according to the evidence and what we were told by OSBI, what it seems to be is some of the family members were already deceased before my daughter was picked up. So if they were inside the house, my daughter and the other friend that spent the night would have seen that and raised alarm. And Jesse had also had conversations with his mother uh, in the weeks prior to the incident about him unaliving himself and he probably feared that his mom would show up at some point that weekend at which she did and that was the reason why his truck was found across the street uh, in the property adjacent to the rental house at which it was owned by the same property owner but he wanted to hide his truck and tell her that Holly took it with the other kids so that way she wasn't concerned of what was going on. How long was our daughter missing for? This is kind of a hard question to answer because our daughter we didn't consider missing for a while because she had spent the night and then the next morning we received a snapchat from her phone which we do not believe us from her. In a previous video I made, I stated that my daughter had always sent, said things like, I love you, mom, and mom, mom, I love you, all that stuff. But the message that I got was very rushed and very, like, we got to go to the ranch. It was very, it was like that. It was just, and then I even at one point said, like, I love you, and never got a message like that back. It was just kind of cold. Um, OSBI believes it was from Jesse. Um, and then it was said that they would be back by five. They were going to McAllister at the ranch, which they, which they had done before. Um, around 5 p.m., I received a phone call from Jesse saying that they weren't getting good cell phone service. They were going to be late, which was very, like, normal for their family. Frustrating, but normal, so we didn't 
think anything of it at this point. And, um, and mind you, there's been several other kids within the community. Tiffany was well-known and very popular and had several other friends over there all the time. They would always go to the ranch, go to the lake, have a good time. And, you know, it, this happened for two years uh, yeah. with several of the kids within the community. So for us to be concerned at that moment, it it didn't raise too many alarms. Mm -mm. I'm angry. Um, I cry all the time because I have lost my, my baby girl, my only daughter. I have four boys and I had one girl. I cry all the time. But I'm mad. And I'm mad because... Someone like Jesse did almost 20 years for what he did to his first victim. And not only what did he do what he did to her, while he was in prison, he was reoffending. He was texting another minor and got out and was still able to do this. Now, we didn't know any of that when we let our daughter spend the night. I am so sick and tired of these pedophiles being able to reoffend and do what he did to the those two other victims and get out and continue to do what they do and then five children were murdered and my daughter was essayed my daughter was innocent and pure and one of the sweetest girls I've ever met in my life so this is Wednesday, May 3rd, um, that we were able to gain access into the house by the property owner. Um, we called him because according to Okmulgee County Sheriff's Department, the house was no longer a crime scene. So we wanted to go in because we wanted to look for our daughter's cell phone, her mini black backpack purse, and her light blue Adidas duffel bag, as well as her cell phone. So some of the things when we first went into the house, we noticed that there was the mattress laying in the living room with the bloody wipe on the floor. We noticed Tiffany's cow comforter was in Jesse and Holly's room on their bed, along with the adult toys everywhere. The headboard Jesse made, as well as the chains everywhere and the paraphernalia and when we went into the laundry room, that was Jesse's office. And if you see in this picture that I have, that's all of his, like his little setup. So that's his computers. This is in the little laundry room. So that was all left behind. Um, and then we noticed in Holly's office, Hers was blocking the back exit, so the back doorway. All the windows were like nailed shut, and we believe this is because when Jesse essayed his first victim, she escaped through the back door, and this is something Jesse may have learned and didn't want to happen to him again. So there was only one way in and one way out of the house. Um, after we saw all that, we, we were like appalled. Like this is Friday, May 5th. Um, and we were at the house working on Ivy's garden. The community came together and wanted to put together a really nice garden for Ivy. Um, Jesse's first victim, Crystal was down because once she heard the news, she just instantly drove down and that was our first time meeting her. And so when we were at the house, one of her friends that she knew happened to drive by and saw Holly's family taking things out of the house. So she called Crystal and Crystal told us. So we flew down there and kind of, we saw, this was Lynn Wyatt and I don't know, remember who the girl in the pink shirt is. And then there was a reporter there, Aaron Christie and my husband kind of got into it with them because they were removing things from the house. Well, as soon as we got down there, we obviously in this picture observed them taking stuff out of the house um, and placing it into their car and into their trunk. 
And uh, obviously I was yelling at him, telling him, look, you know, we just found our daughter's phone along with evidence in the house the day before and we're calling for a second investigation. And uh, at that point we were feeling we were pretty close to possibly getting something done. And they're there taking evidence out of the house, which obviously can't happen. Um, so a back and forth argument continued at which somebody within the parties uh, called the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office once again to come down and I guess mediate the argument at which when they arrived, um, the one deputy said, look, you know, we're not doing another investigation as far as them. And they, if the property owner was going to allow us in the house, which he did, we're allowed to be there. And uh, so awkwardly at that point, both families kind of looked at each other and said, you know what, screw it. If Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office isn't going to do anything, then let's just go in and try to find our own answers. And so both families kind of weirdly teamed up together. We went back inside and... Um, at that point, baby clothes were found. I know that was mentioned before. Um, they were not bloody. They were found in a tub, rolled up, folded up nicely uh, in the top of Holly and Jesse's closet. Um, many electronics still left over. We had hoped that they would take them after taking the cell phones. They didn't appear to take anything other than the phones. We found more, but cell phones. More cell phones we found. We found the ledger uh, that had some names. One of them was including uh, Jesse's second victim and some birthdays. I believe his mom was one of the ones listed on yeah. there. So it was questionable if it was the actual ledger or not, but seeing Jesse's second victim on there with her date of birth was a little concerning. And with everything that we were still finding inside the house, we went back out to the deputy, all of us together, and handed him what could have been a ledger and said, hey, look, you know, clearly there's a lot of evidence still in here. And there's questions that if there's even more victims and I, we really think you guys need to do another investigation on this house to clear out some of these questions. And that's when uh, we also found out that Lynn had found some more electronics in the house that she had already put into her trunk before we even got there. And she was trying to convince me not to tell the deputy to take them. And I was telling her that's not the right thing to do, um, especially if there's information on there and we do get a second investigation, they need to have these electronics. So I was able to convince her to give up at least those electronics. And we gave the, the ledger to the deputy as well, or the supposed ledger to the deputy as well. And at which he told us all, it's time for us to leave the house and not come back. And uh, at that point, you know, we all left and Lynn still had uh, stuff in her car. Um, what exactly was in there? I don't know, but she did take evidence from the scene of the crime. Now, I know that that was a lot, but I think the biggest takeaway in so much of that is the fact that the authorities, it seemed like, allegedly at least, like they were just ready for the case to be closed. They were done with the crime scene. They weren't taking any more evidence. Nothing. And I think we can all agree that the families of the victims never in a million years should have had to be the ones to essentially bag up evidence and bag it up themselves and then take it to the sheriff's doorstep and beg them to open up another investigation. That burden should never have to fall on the victims' families. Yet, here we are here's what happened. So the main focus since all of this has pretty much been getting this law passed, trying to prevent it from happening to other families, trying to protect other children. And this is why I focused so much on that law. I know that it was a lot to digest and that we focused a lot on the families and the advocacy, but that's what is important here. We can't change the past. We can't rewrite history. But something that we constantly say on the podcast and over on my YouTube channel with other cases is, the goal in covering these cases isn't to relive the salacious details and the grossness and all of that. 
It's to hopefully evoke change. It's to generate awareness. It is to hold people accountable, to get justice, to allow victims' voices to continue to be heard. So in this situation, it is such a great illustration of that. There is an opportunity for real change to happen. It stemmed from tragedy, and that is horrible, but like I said, we can't rewrite history. So how can we take this? How can we learn from it? And how can we hopefully prevent it from happening to future victims and children? And it's my belief that that's why that needs to be the focus, especially in today's case. The system may be broken. We talk about that all the time, especially if you're somebody like me who consumes a lot of true crime. One of the number one topics we're always talking about is how broken the system is. However, we all know that nothing will ever change if we don't push for that change. We can't wait until we're in the same position as Ivy's parents and other friends and families of all of these victims, you know, begging for change and for people to listen. The time is now. So please, again, take a look at that law. I'm going to link everything in my description. And if you feel called to sign it, please do so. And even more, if you feel like you want to share the link to that, if you feel like you want to share this episode, the more eyes that get on this, the better. So thank you so much for listening. I know today's case was difficult. Thank you for sharing it. If you end up sharing it in your group chat with your friends on your social media, And let's just continue to keep all of the victims, friends, and families in our thoughts and prayers. And hopefully we can put systems in place to prevent things like this from happening in the future. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode. I will be back on the mic with you first thing Thursday morning for headline highlights where we talk through everything going on this week in the true crime world. As a reminder, if you are watching this on YouTube, those episodes on Thursdays are exclusive to the podcast, but you can listen to it for free anywhere you get your podcasts. Also, I just want to mention too, We launched merch last week, and this collection is very important to me because we called it the Stay Safe Collection. It's all about staying safe. A portion of the proceeds are all going to different charitable organizations, but one of the items that we spent a lot of time building out is a safety kit. It's our Stay Safe Safety Kit. In it, we have alarms, tools for escaping cars, seatbelt cutters, hotel locks because hotel lo- people are breaking into hotels even when it's locked and sometimes it's the staff, drink covers because of roofies. I mean, uh, the whole gamut. So check the safety kit out. It was something that was really important to me when we were putting it together because I think not only should everybody have one of those in their glove box, in their home, in their purse, wherever it is, but also It's a great item, especially now going back to school with so many kids going back to college, to give to your kids, to give to your daughters. We're in the process of working with a lot of sororities to get all of these girls these safety kits. And it's just a good gift to give to somebody who may not purchase it for themselves. And the goal we say at the end of every episode, that's our sign off, is stay safe. That really is the goal. So It was important to us when we were putting this together. And sorry, I know that I just kind of rambled a little bit because I didn't really know what I was going to say, but it just reminds me of, I feel everybody needs something like that to just, you can't even run in the daylight anymore without worrying if somebody's going to attack you. So we have the alarms, we have everything in there. So check it out. It's at AnnieElise.com. But um, I don't know, guys, that's all I really have. Please just stay safe. That was probably the worst outro ever on this podcast, but whatever. I'm keeping it real. I will talk with you guys again soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.